Hello and welcome to Holy Impact Ministries Bible Study Night. It is Wednesday. God bless you. I'm Pastor Scott Blaine with HolyImpactMinistries.com and we are once again moving into the fifth chapter of the book of Romans. Now for those of you who have not been uh, with us for the uh, first uh, few uh, chapters of Romans, uh, we'd like to encourage you to go back and look at those and, and not begin in the beginning of the study because there is a lot of information that we have covered uh, in the first few chapters of the book of Romans and we will not probably be going through a lot, the, the majority of that uh, again tonight because we've already been through that in the beginning. So um, we urge you not to, uh, not to start in the middle but to go back and uh, check us out, you can uh, see those at uh, our YouTube channel at Holy Impact Ministries, or you can go to holyimpactministries.com and just click on the Bible Studies tab, and you'll find the, uh, the study for the Book of Romans. Uh, again, moving into the fifth chapter, I hope everyone is doing well. I'm excited to see everybody. Uh, I can't believe it is Wednesday again already. Unbelievable. But we are up and at it. And uh, I'm excited about these next uh, few chapters because I think we're going to be able to progress a little bit quicker now that we have a basic foundation and a foundational understanding of the writings of the Apostle Paul. Again, uh, taking heed to the warning of Peter found in 2 Peter 3.16, when he said that the writings of Paul are very difficult to understand, and he said that the unstable would twist them to their own destruction. Knowing this beforehand, he gives us that warning. He says, do not be carried away by lawless people and lose your own stability. So uh, it's important that we know that the writings of Paul uh, are difficult to understand. They're not easy to understand. And uh, what we're going to do today is I'd, I'd like to take some of the scriptures that we've, some of the scriptures we've already actually heard in the book of Romans and contrast them to the book of James. Now, when we get done with the book of Romans, um, I would like to go through the book of James, just not so much of a comprehensive study, but uh, just to kind of go through it a little bit so that we can see the contrast between what the writings of Paul were like and what the writings of James were like. And they, they seem like they, they conflict. They seem like they're not saying the same thing. But in essence, if we know how to keep Paul in the right context, we know that they do agree. Uh, and so we're going to be taking a look at a little bit of that. Now, on our Seventh-day Sabbath program, we looked at some definitions. We looked at the definition of faith, of works, of righteousness. We looked at the uh, different laws that Paul wrote about. And uh, so I'd like to kind of run through those just briefly here today. If you hadn't been with us for our Seventh-day Sabbath uh, program this last Saturday, uh, you can at least get an idea where we are at and why it's important for us to know what the definite definition, the biblical definition of words like, uh, like faith. What is the biblical definition of faith? What does faith entail? Uh, righteousness. What is righteousness? So we need to kind of look at these things. Works. What is works? Uh, we need to kind of know and understand for ourselves what the biblical definition of these words are so that we can understand when we see them exactly what Paul is talking about. So with that being said, let's go over very quickly. We're going to go over to... Um, let me see if we can do the uh, picture viewer because I wanted to take us here. And let's take a look at this first. Now these, very quickly, these are just some of the laws that we find in the book of Romans that Paul preaches about. We have the law of God found in Romans 3.31, 7.22 through 25, and 8.7. We have the law of sin, found in Romans 7, 23, 25. The law of sin and death, found in Romans 8, 2, which is what our Messiah came to die for, was the penalty of the law, not to abolish the law. And we've been discussing that in detail during this study. Uh, most of you that uh, have been with us from the beginning, I think you understand that already. 
Uh, the next one was the law of the spirit of life, Romans 8.2. The law of faith, found in Romans 3.27. The law of righteousness, found in Romans 9.31. And the law of Christ, found in 1 Corinthians 9.21. Now, with all of these different laws that Paul is talking about, it's easy for us to misunderstand. Again, his writing's definitely difficult to understand. And we can certainly see that with all of these different laws that Paul is pertaining to. So I just want us to know and understand, uh, as we are reading through the book of Romans, we need to know and understand which one of these laws Paul is talking about uh, when he talks about these things. And we're going to see some evidence of that moving through the 5th, 6th, and 7th chapters this evening. Uh, and uh, we'll be talking a little bit about some of these laws. Now, let me do this. Let me go to, um, let's start with uh, the definition of faith. I want to just look at that again so that we can understand. Now, we covered this earlier in this Bible study, but I just want us to know and understand when we see the word faith, this is what Paul is talking about. Faith includes the love of God. Faith bears fruit. It is, it, we, could, we will know them by their fruit, their faith. There will be evidence in their faith, of their faith. Obedience to the law. This can be found in 1 John 5, 3. It is also part of faith. Also, Romans 3, 31. Uh, we, uh, faith upholds the law. What does Paul say in Romans 3, 31? Very clearly, he says, do we nullify? He asks the question, do we nullify our faith? By uh, or, or do we nullify the law? I'm sorry. Do we nullify the law by our faith? And of course, he says, absolutely not. On the contrary, he says, we uphold the law. So we can know and we can understand. Paul says that it's not the right the, those that hear the law that are righteous before God. It's those who do the law, not the hearers of the law, but the doers of the law, that will be justified in the eyes of God. So we know these scriptures, and we have heard these scriptures uh, throughout the last few chapters that we have been studying. So we know that Paul is not preaching that the laws have been abolished. He's not preaching that the laws have been done away with. What he's preaching is that the penalty for the law has been done away with. When, when Paul says that we are not under the law, what he is saying is we are not under the penalty of the law. He's not saying don't do the law, or the, the law is null and void. That's not at all what he's saying. He said very clearly in Romans 3.31, we uphold the law. But what he is saying is, once again, that our Messiah died for the penalty of the sin. What is the biblical definition of sin? The transgression of the law. That is what sin is. When you transgress the law, you, according to the Bible, that's what sin is. Okay, so the biblical definition of sin is the transgression of the law. What is the wages of sin? The wages of sin is death. And that's what our Messiah came to, uh, to nail to the cross. If you want to have something nailed to the cross, that's what he nailed to the cross. It was the penalty for sin. Now, that doesn't mean that the law is null and void and that we shouldn't do the law. Once again, we can see faith, and here are these scriptures, and I, I urge you to write these scriptures down and to look at these scriptures. We've already looked at them before. I'm not going to look at them again, but you should write them down if you've never seen these before and go look at these scriptures, and you will know and understand that, that faith includes the love of God. What was the new covenant? The new covenant was that Yahweh God the Father would write his laws in our hearts and in our minds. He didn't say he'd nail them to a cross or do away with them or abolish them. He said he would write them in our hearts and in our minds. That was the essence of the new covenant. And when he sent his son to die on that cross, to be beaten, humiliated, to be flogged and scourged, to, to leave a trail of blood through Jerusalem to the cross, my friends... He wrote those laws in our hearts. If we are truly, truly saved, truly, truly have the Holy Spirit, truly have been baptized by both the water 
and the Spirit, as our Messiah commands us, that we must be or we cannot enter heaven, then we will have God's laws written on our heart. They will mean something to us. His appointments, his feast days, his Moedim, his Sabbaths, not man's Sabbaths, his Sabbaths will mean something to us, and we will keep those laws to the best of our ability. And that's what, my friends, that's what faith is. And it all really encompasses the love of God. And what is the greatest commandment? That you shall love the Lord your God before anything and everything else. Our own Messiah told us, he said, He who loves mother or father more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And we talked about this before. Why did he say that? Because he cannot protect us if we love someone else more. We will always be listening to someone else. We cannot afford to listen to, to someone else. He is our teacher. He is the one that we are to love and put him first. And if we will do that, everything else will fall into place. Okay, so just a little bit about what faith encompasses and everything that's outside of faith. So all of these things, if you're continuing to sin, my friends, you do not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I don't care if you've been baptized by the water or not. If you still are sinning and you still are following the ways and still assimilating yourself into this world, then you need to have the Holy Spirit. You need to be in prayer for his Holy Spirit and to have true faith and to understand what faith really is. Understand what he really did for you. Uh, and this is so, so very important. So this is the definition of faith, and I urge you to study this and to take these scriptures. There are many, 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 many scriptures. These are not the only scriptures that uh, tell us what faith is, but they are just a few that we selected to give us a rounded picture of indeed what faith is. And faith is not just saying, I believe, and uh, then going right back like a dog to its vomit, back into our sin, which again, the definition of sin is, breaking God's laws, profaning his Sabbath, profaning his feast days, profaning his Passover for man's Easter, uh, and these types of things. These are things that profane the name of Yahweh God the Father, and we need not to do those things if we have faith, which includes the love of God. Okay, so let's move on to, uh, I want to go on to the definition of righteousness. Let me see if I can find that. Here it is. Definition of righteousness. Now, this uh, we went through in detail on our seventh day Sabbath. And I'm not going to go through detail in it here. Uh, you can always go to our last seventh day Sabbath program. Uh, you can find that at holyimpactministries.com uh, and uh, you can find it at our YouTube channel as well. But we went through all of this, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. But I do want us to see this chart. We have Paul's unrighteous works. And then we have James talking about righteous works. Now, Paul uh, seems to say in Romans 3.28, he says, Faith apart from uh, works, we, we say that faith uh, is apart from the works of the law. Okay, now what does James say? James says, faith without works is dead. So you see there is conflicting evidence here that what Paul seems to be saying does not, does not fit with what James is saying. But if we know the context of which Paul is speaking, we know that, that Paul and James are both saying the same thing, even though they sound different. But we have to know what Paul was talking, who was he talking to about faith apart from the works of the law? When Paul says faith apart from the works of the law is what justifies us, what he's saying is to the Pharisees, he's speaking to the Pharisees who had the law. The new converts that were coming in, they didn't have the law. They had no idea what Judaism or Christianity even was. They were learning all of these things. They had no idea. They had no Torah. They had no idea. Uh, so he's talking clear, very clearly to those who have the law, who, and that would be the Pharisees, the diehard Pharisees of that time. Now, the Pharisees had written all kinds of laws and they're in their Talmudic laws, uh, in their journals, over top of God's laws. Things like that uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, uh, was constantly berating them for doing this. Not much unlike what Christianity has also done 
written all of its laws over top of God's laws. We now have Christmas. We now have Easter. We now have Valentine's Day. Even Halloween is, is the Catholic All Saints Day. All of, these, all of this garbage and, and rubbish comes from the writings of men. And we have covered up all of God's feast days. We've covered up his Sabbath. We've covered up everything that has to do uh, with the laws of God. Even more so than what the Pharisees did. But we had the same scenario back in Yeshua's time. And these Pharisees, and if you do not believe me, please read the 23rd chapter of Matthew. And know and understand what our Messiah called these Pharisees. These very same Pharisees that Paul is dealing with. He called them a brood of vipers, twofold children of hell, he called them. Washed white tombs, blind guides, he called them. Uh, and you, again, you can find this all in uh, throughout the Bible, throughout the Brit Hadashah. But in the 23rd chapter of Matthew, you can find it very clearly. He was very, very clearly, he was upset with the pastors, priests, and the popish leaders of his time. And uh, again, Christianity has done the exact same thing, overwritten God's laws with all of their own laws. And this is what Paul is talking about when he says that we believe that faith apart from the works of the law is what justifies man. Because the law was no more just God's laws, it was the Pharisaical laws. And he was telling them, if you're going to keep that law, you might as well just forget it. Because you don't have faith. You are not, we are not under the penalty of the law, God's law, any longer. And we're certainly not under your law that you created over top of God's law. So this is some of what Paul is trying to say. He's not saying that God's laws are bad or they're done away with or anything else. What he's saying is that we believe that through faith... Now, what does faith have? Again, we just saw. What does faith have? Faith has obedience to the law. What did Paul say in Romans 3.31? He asks that question. Do we nullify the law by our faith? And he says, on the contrary, he says, absolutely not. We uphold the law. And once again, he says very clearly in the book of Romans, he said, it's not the hearers of the law that will be justified. It will be the doers of the law. James says exactly the same thing in the book of James. And uh, we can look at that as well. So these two, Romans 3.28 and James 2.17, seem like they conflict. But if we know the context that Paul was talking about and who he was talking to, he was talking to the Pharisees, they don't conflict at all. They don't conflict at all. Paul's talking about the Pharisaical laws is what he's talking about and the law that they had coupled God's laws with their own laws. And he's telling them, that law is dead. That law is null and void. And if you're going by the written law, you're going to be lost because you have no faith. We don't obey the laws of God to be saved, to earn our way into heaven. We obey the laws of God because we love God. We know who he is, and we honor him by being obedient to the things of Yahweh God the Father. Romans 4 or 2, Paul seems to say Abraham was not justified by works. But then if you look at James 2.21... Uh, James clearly says that Abraham is justified by his works. Once again, we have to take this into context and we have to know the scriptures. And I urge you to go back and look at our Seventh-day Sabbath where we went over this in detail. Uh, Romans uh, 11.6 says uh, that we are saved by grace and not works. James 2.24 says we're justified by works, not just faith. Uh, are they saying something different here? No, they're not. If we know how to keep Paul's writings in the right context. Romans 3.20, no one is justified by the works of the law. James 2.26 says, faith with, once again, faith without works is dead. you got to have works or your faith is dead. Uh, and we certainly don't want that. So we know if we keep things in the right context, it seems like some of these writings, the two writings of the, these two men say the same things. But Paul was talking to the Pharisees, is who he was speaking directly at. And he was trying to get them to get their head out of the clouds and to bring their head out of the clouds, plant their feet firmly on the ground, and to understand that they, they are joined into the same olive tree that these new converts are coming into. And we are all one in Christ. And if we look at the book of Galatians, we know that we are the if we are in Christ, 
then we are the offspring of Abraham and heirs to the promise of the Israelite people. And again, these last two uh, verses down here were just a couple of verses that I chose. There are many more where Paul says very clearly, we uphold the law. Now, we're not just hearers of the law, but we're supposed to be doers of the law. So I just wanted us to kind of get the, uh, the biblical definition of works, not righteousness. I think I said righteousness earlier. This is the biblical definition of works. And we need to know that there are, there are bad works, works of the devil, and then there are works of Yahweh God the Father. There are bad and good works. These works, it, what Paul is talking about, are bad works. If you think that you can obey the law and not without faith, apart from faith, you're, gonna, you're, you're never going to make it because you don't have faith. You're never going to keep the law without faith and without the Holy Spirit of God to lead you and to guide you and to have God write his laws in your heart. You must understand what his son did because if you don't understand what his son did, his laws will not be written in your heart. They won't mean anything to you if you don't understand what he did. And uh, I hope this all makes sense for you. Uh, let's take a look at, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the, uh, the um, biblical definition of righteousness. We can find this in Deuteronomy 6.25. What is righteousness? When we see the word righteousness, what does that mean? Well, Deuteronomy 6.25 in the Old Testament says this, And it will be righteousness for us, if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God as he commanded us. So righteousness is to obey the commandments of Yahweh God the Father. Let's go to the New Testament, Luke 1, 6. What does it say? And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. That is what righteousness is. James 1, 22 but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. What did, what did Paul, we just, we just said, Paul said the exact same thing. It is not the hearers of the word, it's the doers of the, of the word. We, got it, we have to be doers. Uh, Psalms 48, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is where? Within my heart, says David, a man who is well ahead of his time. And a, a man who was who had the heart of God Himself. Uh, Psalms one nineteen thirty four. Give me understanding that I may keep Your law and observe it with my whole heart. Again, it's all about God's law being in the heart of man, and not just some mechanical thing that He does to earn His way into heaven. We're never going to be able to earn our way into heaven. We don't deserve to go to heaven. It is only by the grace of God and his kindness that he has sent his only begotten son to be a propitiation, a payment for our past sins. And when we sin, if we do sin, we, we, we can now come to the Father. We, we were never able to come to the Father before. The Israelites, during the, uh, during the tent of meeting, and during the tabernacle, only on the seventh-day Sabbath could they come, and then they couldn't even enter into the holy place, but they could look in. They could only look in. We now can come unto the Father, but only through the Son. So those who do not believe in the Son cannot come to the Father. So that is why our Jewish brothers and sisters need to understand who their Messiah is, and that he's already been here. He's been prophesied all through the Old Testament, through the Torah, and he has come. He is here, and he is returning. But he says very clearly that he will not return until they accept him in Jerusalem. Those days are coming, my friends. We have so many people that have turned Messianic Jews now, Jewish brothers and sisters who now have come to the reality and are coming to the reality every day, hundreds and thousands of them, that you, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, is their Messiah. Praise God for that. Okay, now I just wanted to run through these things uh, with you very quickly uh, before we get uh, too far ahead of ourselves here. And I just want us to know and to understand what the biblical definition 
uh, of some of these words is before we get into this Bible study. Now we're going to go ahead and we're going to we're going to read through the next few chapters, and I think we'll be able to go through them fairly quickly because we already have the knowledge and the foundation that we need to now understand what these scriptures are saying. And we'll slow down a little bit uh, during some of the difficult parts, and we'll explain those as we go along. But before we do that, let's pray very quickly and ask for the discernment from Yahweh God the Father to understand what it is that we are reading. And I'd like to do that before we, before we get started here. Let's go ahead and do that. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray, Father, hallowed is your holy name, high and far above all names. We thank you, Lord God, for your mercy and for your grace and for the blood that covers our heads. We praise you high and far above any name, Father. We ask that everyone here that joins us with this Bible study this evening, each and every person would have the discernment to know and to understand the truth of your word. We ask, Lord God, for the discernment from you, because we know that you are the only one that can deliver discernment to us. You are our teacher. And we ask in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, your Son, the only name by which men can come to you, Father. We ask in his name for this discernment that we may be able to understand the writings of the Apostle Paul and your word. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay. Now, with that being said, let's go ahead and dig into uh, Romans, the fifth chapter here. Let me get over to uh, Eastward here. I've got my... Uh, there we go. Okay. So let's go ahead and begin uh, on the fifth chapter of Romans. If you have a cup of coffee, hope you have a cup of coffee or a glass of milk or whatever it is you drink before you go to bed. I uh, hope you're comfortable. Let's just go ahead and read this together. Romans 5.1. Therefore... Since we have been justified by faith, now remember what faith, I highlighted that so that we'll remember what does faith entail. Faith has obedience to the law, the love of God, all of those things encompass the, the Holy Spirit of God, all encompass faith. And we've looked at that and we can know through the scriptures that that's what faith is. It's not just something we say and then go do as we please. So again, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And, and we've said this many times at HolyImpactMinistries.com. We actually, we say that we are saved, but we really don't get saved until the resurrection. Uh, the Bible tells us very clearly, and, and uh, Yeshua tells us in uh, Matthew 24, he says very clearly, He who endures to the end will be saved. Not he who is raptured out in the middle of things or, uh, or that falls by the wayside or any of these things. We know very clearly through the scripture we must endure to the end. We have the hope of salvation, and it is very important that we are in the Word of God every day, and especially in these end times, because I, I am telling you, my friends, I have never seen so much evil in my entire life. In all of my 55 years, I have not seen this kind of evil. And uh, let me get rid of uh, this telephone here. Uh, you should never get into a Bible study with your phone on. That's a silly thing. Let's get rid of that noise. Okay. So, uh, let's continue on. Uh, so, we have the hope of the glory of God. We are working and walking towards our salvation. Romans 5.3, he says, Not only that we uh, rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance is what we must have. How many times have we said that? We must pray for discernment and endurance. Let's read that again. Not only that, he says, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, 
and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the time Christ died for the ungodly, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of Yahweh God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled, reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Now, I want us to know that word reconciled. What is what's he talking about there? He's talking about the lost sheep of the northern kingdom of Israel. They were divorced from God for their idolatry. He divorced them and he, and he sent them and scattered them into the four corners of the earth. And when Yeshua came back, what did he say he came back for? Who did he say he came for? He said, I have come for the lost sheep of Israel. That's what I've come for. He came to put the two sticks of Ezekiel back into one. The northern and the southern kingdoms be, would be back grafted into one olive tree, and the rest of the nations of the world who would come to believe upon him would all be grafted into that olive tree. That's why it tells us in the book of Galatians, and Paul tells us very clearly, that if we are in Christ, we are offsprings of Abraham and heirs to the promise God gave to Abraham, our father. Uh, okay, so uh, let's go ahead and continue on. It says, uh, let's see here, where were we now? Okay. We're going to go down here start at uh, Romans 5.11. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So again, he mended those two sticks and made the kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom one kingdom again, the Israelites, the only people that God ever chose in the word of God. There is no other people that God ever chose. It wasn't the Americans, not the French, not the Japanese, not the Chinese, not the Russians, not the Persians, not the Pakistanis, no one else, not the Turks, no one. But the Israelites, they have always been his chosen people, his bride, and they still are today. And if we are in Christ, who was a Jew, they called him rabbi, he came from the house of David, the tribe of Judah, we are Israelites. We have been grafted into that olive tree of God's chosen people. And whom Yeshua, Hamashiach, a Jew, is the root. Okay, so, uh, and we'll get into that as we go through Romans 11. When we get there, you'll really understand all of that when we get there. So, he says, more than that, he said, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Okay, very good. I just want to make sure that we have that. Let's move on. 512. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, he's talking about Adam now, who, who fell in the garden. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin... And so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. So what is Paul saying here? He's saying that before Adam, he said there is, there is even sin in the world before God gave us the law. So sin was here before, but it was not counted until God gave us the law. He gave Adam the law. God, we know that, because otherwise Adam could not have sinned. What is sin? It is the transgression of the law. We know that the law was not given at Mount Sinai alone. We know full well, if we look at Abraham, we can read the book of Exodus and know and understand uh, why it was that God chose Abraham to be the father of all nations. Why? It says very clearly, because he obeyed my commandments, my laws, and my precepts. 
and heard my voice. That's why. So we know that the laws of God were in effect at the time of Adam. Okay? But uh, so what Paul is saying here is he was saying before Adam, he said there was sin in the world, but the law wasn't there. So uh, the, well, the sin cannot be counted where there is no law. So we know that God gave his laws to Adam, and Adam broke those laws. He transgressed against the law of God. And this is what caused the curse of death, that the serpent told the woman was not going to happen. Of course, another lie. So let's read that again. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, talking about Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those sinning, was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Again, Adam being a type, the type of Yeshua HaMashiach, and was supposed to be able to do what Yeshua did, but he fell. Okay, Romans 5.15. But the, three, the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abound for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one righteous act leads to the justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Again, there's that word righteous. What does that mean? That means following the things of God and keeping keeping the things of Yahweh God, the laws of God. He continues, he says, Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness. Now what was the definition of righteousness? Remember, keeping the commandments and the laws and the precepts of Yahweh God the Father leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's continue on, number, or chapter 6. He says, what shall we say then? He says, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Once again, my friends, baptism is not a sprinkling of water on the forehead. It is full immersion and signifies the going down into the grave, dead, along with Yeshua. What did he say? Follow me, following him into the grave, and being raised up a new creature, a new being and filled with the Holy Spirit of God, and picking up our cross and following him, not because of a written law, but because his laws are written in our hearts. Okay. He says, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And what does that mean? That doesn't mean once saved, always saved. Okay, I've done what I had to do. Now I can just go back like to my sin, like a dog to his vomit. No, no. He says very clearly here, we, so that we may walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self, our sinful self, was crucified with him in order that the body of sin 
might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. You see what he's saying? He's saying so that we would not be driven to continuously break God's laws. Okay, that's what he's saying. What is sin? Tran the transgression of the law. If you take away the law, you take away sin. If you take away sin, there's no need for grace, is there? No. So the law must be there, and we know and we can understand that is exactly what Paul is saying right here. He's saying, we know that our old self, that old sinful man, was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer sin. We would no longer break his laws. We would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Christ, live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin. Listen to this now. Once for all. Once for all. The Roman Catholic Church and their mass and they're putting him back on the cross again. And, and the idea that this priest and through their transubstination can make that wafer flesh and the wine, the real blood, and make people believe this over and over again is absolutely demonic. And it is paganry, my friends. Again, that round wafer is nothing but sun god worship. That's what it is. What does it say? For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. It doesn't mean keep putting him on the cross over and over again. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, it tells us if we continue to sin, we can't keep putting him back on the cross. There remains no sacrifice for sin. If knowing the truth, if we, after we know the truth, if we continue to sin, tells us very clearly, Hebrews 10, then there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. And the only thing we have to look forward to is the pit. So we need to know these things. Once for all, he died. He doesn't die over and over and over again. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive in God in Jesus Christ. What is sin? The transgression of the law, which means you're not going to transgress the law anymore. You don't want to transgress the law anymore. The law is written in your heart where God wants them to be. That was the whole new covenant in the book of Jeremiah. I believe it's 3131. Look at it. Look at it for yourself. That's the new covenant that he would write his laws in our hearts. Okay. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. It's all about the body, the flesh, and what the flesh wants. What is he saying? You need to be spiritual, and the spiritual man must take control of of this physical body and make it submit to the spirit, not the other way around. We don't want the body telling us what we what it wants to go do, and we go do what the body wants to do. We are to be in the spirit, have the Holy Spirit of God, love God with all our heart, minds, and strength, have his heart, his laws written in our hearts, and to be doing the things of Yahweh God, and not the things of the body, not the things we want to do. But we want, we want to do the things he wants us to do. And that comes by having the Holy Spirit and by keeping his commandments, by keeping his Sabbaths, by keeping his appointments, his Moedim. Okay. He says, Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. Now, if righteousness is obeying the law, we know that, right? We just saw the definition of righteousness. Then what is unrighteousness? Unrighteousness is being sinful and going back like a dog to its vomit, back into our sin. Okay, so remember, unrighteousness means the opposite of righteousness. He says, "Don't present the members to, uh, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for." There it is righteousness. What is the definition of righteousness? Obeying the commandments and the laws and the precepts of Yahweh God the Father. It's in every scripture. That is the biblical definition of righteousness. He says, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Now, 
This is the most used scripture time and time again that people will say, see, I'm not under law, I'm under grace, so I can do whatever I want. So when people want to sin, they will use this scripture to say it's okay for them to sin. But is that what Paul is saying? What is he saying? You're not under law, but under grace. What was the penalty of the law? If you're under law, then you're under that penalty of the law. What was the penalty of the law? It was death. What is the wages of sin? Death. Right? That was the penalty of the law. So if there is no penalty of the law, then we are no longer under the law. Does that mean we don't keep the law? Does that mean we do not do the law? Absolutely not. What did Paul say in Romans 3.31? Do we nullify the law by our faith? Absolutely not. We uphold the law, right? So Paul is not saying that the law is dead and thrown away with or abolished. What he's saying is you are not under the penalty of the law anymore. We are under God's grace. But that does not nullify the law. And what did our Messiah, uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, tell us in the 17th chapter of Matthew? He says, I did not come to abolish the law. I didn't even come to change the dotting of an I or the crossing of a T until heaven and earth pass away and all is accomplished. He said, the law, God's laws still stand. And I did not come to do away with them. He was very clear and concise. He says, I came to fulfill them, which means he came to do them. And what are we supposed to do? Follow him. Do the same things. We are dead and buried. We rise up. We put away sin. And we follow God by obeying and be obedient to the things of Yahweh God the Father. It really flows like a river if we just know how to read the text. And we know the con to keep in the right context of what Paul was saying. And again, if we have any doubts about that, all we have to do is go back and know and understand it was Paul himself that said we do not nullify the law by our faith. We uphold the law. It's not the hearers of the law that are justified, it's the doers of the law. What does James say all through the book of James? He's very clear about it. And the two men do agree on this concept. So we know what he's talking about here. He's talking once again, talking to the Pharisees here, and trying to get them to understand, you know what, it's not all about your written law. It's about the laws of God that are written in your heart and doing the things of God because you love him. <clears throat> and understanding that the penalty for sin has been done away with at the cross. Okay, very good. But that does not nullify God's law by any means. Okay. So listen to what he says. He says, what then? He says, are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Romans 6.15, let's read it again because it's very clear. Paul is saying exactly what we've been preaching here tonight. What then, he says, are we to sin because we're not under the law but under grace? By no means, he says. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, what is sin, the transgression of the law, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. What is righteousness? Following the things of God, obeying his laws, commandments, his precepts. You see, Paul is not any, in any way preaching against God's laws at all. Not at all. He's preaching against the observance of the law apart from faith. Those who are trying to obey the law and don't believe that Jesus came, or the, the, the Son of God, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ the Messiah, died on the cross for our sins. They're still believing just in the law and the law alone, apart from faith. And all of their man-made laws and garbage that they wrote over top. Which the whole thing now is just a big mess. And that's why God swept that away and replaced it with faith. Which is, uh, includes in its nucleus, the obedience of God's laws. Okay, let's read that again so we can verify this. He says, or let's start at Romans 6.14 and read the whole thing. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Okay, what he's talking about, if you're not under the law, he's talking about the penalty of the law. You're not under the penalty of the law anymore, right? Okay. He says, what then? He says, are we to sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? He says, by no means. That doesn't mean we throw the law away. He says, do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are the slaves of the one whom you obey, 
either of sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. You know, Bob Dylan wrote a song many, many years ago, my friends. And the title of that song was, You're Going to Serve Somebody. It might be the devil, or it might be the Lord, but you're going to serve somebody. And that's exactly what Paul is saying right here. Exactly what he's saying. Okay, very good. He says, I am speaking in human terms because of, uh, we're going to start at Romans 6.19 if I've lost you here. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, okay, what's the opposite of being lawful? Lawlessness, right? He says, leading to more lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness, following the law of God, leading to sanctification because you love him. Okay? For when you were slaves of sin, you were free to regard uh, you were free in regard to righteousness because you were living by sin, which means you didn't care about righteousness, okay? But he says, listen to this. He says, what fruit were you getting at the time from the things of which you are now ashamed? He says, what were you, what were you getting? What did you get by all of that sin? Nothing but a headache. It leads to death. You got nothing. He says, for the end of those things is death. But now, he said, that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, Yahweh. Slaves of God means that doesn't mean that I can do as I please and do as I will. Slaves of God means you're obedient to the things of God. If we are slaves to someone, then we are to be obedient to that person. We have made ourselves slaves. We choose this path, is what, is what uh, Paul is saying. But now that you have been set free from sin by the Holy Spirit who helps us to stay away from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. That is our hope. That is what we pray for endurance for so that we can endure to the end and be saved, as our Messiah says in the 24th chapter of Matthew. Once again, Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He came to do away with that penalty, the penalty of the, of the wages of sin, which was death. Okay, let's move on to, uh, let's see, I've got the wrong uh, mouse. I'm moving with the wrong computer here. Moving on to chapter 7. He says, or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law. What's who, who's that? The Pharisees. That's who he's speaking to. So let's, let's hear that again. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law. The Pharisees know the law. The new converts don't. He, he says, I'm speaking to you Pharisees. That the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. He says, for a married woman is bound to bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is still alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ. So that you may also you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. Okay? So what is he saying here? He's saying very clearly, he says, You have died to the law through the body of Christ. Okay? So what is he saying? The law of sin and death. That's the law he's talking about. Remember, what did we say back here? Let's go take a look at, uh, at, that, at that again. What were the different laws that uh, Paul spoke about? Right here they are. And right here it is. The law of sin and death. Romans 8, 2. That is what our Messiah came to die for, was the law of sin and death. That's what he's talking about here, right here. He's talking about the law apart from faith. Okay, let's go back to... Uh, Eastward here, and let me get my thing all centered up here. 
Okay. Very good now. Now, where were we? Where was I at here? I said, okay, very good. So you may belong to another group. For we were in the flesh. For while we were uh, living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. What is bearing fruit for death? What is fruit? Fruit is works, evil works. What is Paul talking about? Evil works. That's what Paul's talking about. What does James concentrate on? He concentrates on good works, fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, obedience to the things of God, Yahweh. Okay? What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. The law is not sin, Paul says. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not known. I would have not known sin. He says, for I would have not known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I once was alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin came alive, and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me. And through it, killed me. What was, how did it kill him? Well, very clearly, we go right back to what is the definition of sin? Transgression of the law. What's the wages of sin? Death. That's what he's talking about here. He says, so the law, listen to this now. This is Paul speaking in the red, seven, Romans 7, 12. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Okay? This is what Paul says. The law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and it's righteous, and it's good. It's not a curse. Okay? It's not a curse. It's not bondage. It's holy. The commandment is holy, and it's righteous and good. Do we nullify the law by our faith? Absolutely not. We uphold the law. We are obedient to the things of God and obeying His laws not to be saved, but because we are saved and His commandments are written in our hearts. Okay, let's continue on down here. It says, Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under the sin. So here it is. The law is spiritual. It's not written down. It's not some set of instructions that you have to go back and read like a manual. It's in your heart. It's where God wants his laws to be. When we see that this is his laws and God says, that I want you to keep my seventh day Sabbath because it's a perpetual agreement for all generations. It's a sign between me and my people above all things in the book of Exodus. Above all, he says, keep my seventh day Sabbath. That means something to us. It means something to us. Not because it's written down and because it's some mechanical thing that we have to obey but because it's in our heart, because we know it pleases our Father, Yahweh God, because we saw what sin is and what it leads to. We saw it at the cross. We saw it in its full, ugly measure. We know what sin is and what the cost of sin is and what it cost our Messiah. And we want to have nothing to do with it. And this... Because we know this, because we've seen this, because we believe this, it causes the laws of God to be in our heart. And that's why we choose to be obedient to the things of Yahweh God. Okay. He says very clearly, um, let's see here. The spirit, the law is spiritual, Romans 7:14. For we know that the law is spiritual. Okay, it's spiritual. But I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. And again, he's talking about the flesh having control over the spirit. This is what happens. He said, now if I, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. 
So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. So he's saying this flesh is corrupt. This flesh is corrupt. That's why we must become spiritual. We must think spiritually. We must pray spiritually. How does God want to be worshipped? In spirit and in truth. That's how he wants to be worshipped. He doesn't want to be worshipped like a bunch of pagans with pagan Christmas trees and Santa Clauses and magical elves and flying reindeer and bunnies that lay eggs. That's not how he wants to be worshipped. He says, I want to be, I am God, I am a spirit, and I want to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. And that's what Paul's talking about here. He says, now if I do not want to, he says, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. What's he talking about? In my spirit, my spirit man, my spirit woman, my spirit person. I delight in the law of God in my inner being, in, 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 in inner being, in my spirit. But, he says, I see in my members, in my flesh, another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. Now, who's he talking about? He's talking about all of us. All of us. He says, who will deliver me from this body of death? Who is it that will deliver him? We know who it is. Before we even read the next sentence, what does he say? Thanks be to God through Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ the Messiah, our Lord and Savior, so that I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. He's waking up. He knows and he understands this. Now I want to clinch this and I want to tighten this down. We're not going to read all of Romans 8, but we're going to read the first paragraph because I love what he says right after this. And I want to clamp this down in your thinking and in your hearing. We're going to go down here to about uh, 8, 7. He says, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from what? The law of sin and death. That's what he died for. The penalty of breaking the law, of transgressing the law, was death. What is the wages of sin? Death. That's what he did away with. He didn't do away with the laws of God. He didn't change the crossing of a T or a dotting of an I. He paid the price for sin for us. That doesn't mean we throw away the laws of God. That means we hold them dear. Okay. He says, For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What is he talking about? He says that's what Yeshua HaMashiach came to die for, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, that we might be able to finally keep the law of God. Okay, who we who walk not in the flesh, continuing to sin, returning like a dog to our vomit, but according to the spirit and walking in the newness of life and in the spirit and thinking with our spirit and knowing and having the spirit man control the flesh, the other half of us, the fleshly man. Okay. So that's what it's all about. It's not about walking in the body anymore. It's about walking in the Spirit. And if you're walking in the Spirit, you are obedient to the things of God. Do we nullify the law by our faith? Paul asks, and he answers, By no means we uphold the law. That's exactly what he's saying here. Exactly. He says, for those who, uh, who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Now listen to what he says. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Romans 8, 7. 
for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Do we understand that? Let's go back and read that. Romans 8, 7. Let's read it again. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. So if we're continuing to do what our flesh wants to do, we're continuing to transgress against the, the laws of God and to make void what Yeshua HaMashiach Jesus did for us, and we're continuing to just return to our sin like a dog to its vomit. He says we can't do that. We can't live according to the flesh. We must live according to the things of God, according to the Spirit. What does he say? For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to, the, to God's law. Dude, so in other words, he's saying we need to submit to God's law. Those who are in the Spirit do submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. One more time, Romans 8, 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. They can't because they are in the flesh. They are apart from faith. They do not have faith. They do not have what the requirement of faith is. All right, my friends. I think we're going to leave it right there uh, for this evening. I hope and I pray that, that this teaching was a blessing. There's so much more to say. I mean, we really could talk about this over and over and tie these scriptures in uh, just nice and tight. And that's what we're trying to do little bit by little bit. Um, I want you to do your homework on these things, uh, and I hope you wrote those scriptures down that we talked about uh, as far as faith, so that you know what faith is, the biblical definition of faith, the biblical definition of righteousness, the biblical definition of works. Know the difference between good works and bad works. Works, keeping the law, thinking you're going to earn your way in heaven, is dead. That's not going to work if you don't have faith. You gotta want to uh, keep God's Sabbath days. You gotta want to meet Him at His appointments and at His His Passover. You gotta want to keep the actual anniversary of the day He died, which was Passover Day, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All four apostles agree that He died on Passover Day, which was also known as Preparation Day, preparation for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was the very next day, also known as uh, a High Sabbath. Okay, we'll talk about all of those things, uh, but it all flows together nicely like a river if you just know how to keep it in context. There are no conflicting scriptures, even though, as we shown, have shown, the writings of Paul almost really seem to completely are 360 degrees away from the writings of James. And that's why, as soon as we get done with Romans, we're going to go over and take a look at the writings of James so that we can see and solidify and know that these two men were actually saying the same things. It was just that Paul had a problem preaching to the Pharisees who believed in the law apart from faith and a law that was not just God's law, but it was something that they had mixed God's law with their own law. Okay, And that, that kind of law was null and void to begin with. And that's what Yeshua told them. He says, you have made void the word of God in order to hold on to your own traditions. Okay? So we need to know that. We need to know and understand. There's nothing different about yesterday's pastors, priests, and uh, popish leaders, and today's pastors, priests, and popish leaders. They're the same. They're the same Pharisees. They're all, they're, some are on the Christian side, some are on the Jewish side. Even today, the Sanhedrin lives. They believe in their Talmudic laws and all of their, this stuff that they've written down, not paying ten attention to the laws of God. He said very clearly in the book of Deuteronomy uh, 31, he said, what, or 1231, he says, be careful to do as I command you. Be careful, he says, to do as I command you. Do not add to it and do not take away from it. What do we not understand about that? And both Jew and Gentile have done the exact same thing. And this is much of the reason why the Jewish man can't come to Christianity because he thinks in his mind that Catholicism is Christianity because that's what he's been told all this time. He doesn't realize that Catholicism is not Christianity. It is paganism. It is paganism. It has nothing to do with Yahweh God the Father. 
It doesn't have anything to do with him. They don't keep his Sabbaths. They don't keep his feast days. They don't keep his laws. They've changed his Ten Commandments. They've changed everything. They even dressed in the very garb and vestments that they dressed in are pagan. The crozier staff that they have, pagan. The pine cone on it is pagan. They still have the, the, the body of Christ still hanging from the cross instead of seated at the right hand of God where he belongs. The fish hat was the, from the god Dagon. All of these things, dragons on their door handles, and these murals that they have painted of witches and the Sumain uh, Sibyl, uh, on the on the their the top of St. Peter's Basilica, all of this wickedness. I mean, it is all around them. When you know what you're looking at, when you have the discernment, when you study history, when God gives you that knowledge, you know what you're looking at. When you look at that demonic monstrosity called the Vatican, and I don't want to get into all of that because that's another teaching. But if you'd like to know more about that, let me say this before I let you go. If you'd like to know more about that, my friends, I'd like you to just, uh, let me see if I can take you over to our website very quickly because I want to show you a video uh, that you need to see. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see if I can get to uh, our website here very quickly. Just before I let you go, this is important. Um, as far as church history is concerned, here is our website. Now, if you go over here to Church History and just click on that, and it'll take a moment to uh, to get that in. Whoops, got the wrong thing there. There we go. It'll take a moment because there are a lot of videos uh, here in this. But there is a video if you want to know a little bit about church history and you want to know the truth about what is going on and how the laws of God have been changed and who changed them. Take a look at this particular first video right here in the middle called A Lamp in the Dark. Okay, A Lamp in the Dark, When Christianity Was Stolen from the World. I want you to look at this and use this as a springboard into your own investigation that you might know the truth about how the Gentiles have covered up God's laws just the same way that the Pharisees have done it. And uh, I want you to know that. So go to our website, check out A Lamp in the Dark. If you, if you can't get to our website, just go to YouTube and type in A Lamp in the Dark. It's on YouTube. You can get it there for free. Watch it. Uh, and, and you will be blown away if you've never seen these things or never understood these things before. And then, as I say, use that as a springboard to do into your own investigation. Look into it. Test it and verify it for yourself so that you may know that it indeed, uh, much of what is in that is the truth. Okay, uh, I just want to say these things, and I want to protect us as a pastor to keep the flock away from all of this wickedness. Is a very it is so difficult because the deception of this world is so it is just so thick. It's hard to breathe. It's hard to breathe, my friends. Everything that we do in this world, every all of the holidays that we celebrate and the Sabbaths that we think are Sabbaths are not Sabbaths, and they are not the appointments of God. And it's important for us in the book of Romans to know that Paul was not preaching against the laws of God. He was preaching for the laws of God. And that's exactly uh, what James taught and exactly what our Messiah taught. He always obeyed the laws. He was at every feast. He was at every seventh day Sabbath, my friends. And there is no first day of the week Sabbath in the Word of God anywhere. It's not in there, and you can't find it. And the reason you can't find it is because it's not in there. And uh, we know that. And, and, and the Roman Catholic Church and their catechism admit it and even berate the Protestant Church for keeping their first day of the week. You know, it, it, we've said this many times over. But again... Uh, if you want to know more about church history, please dig into church history, because when you do, uh, your heart will sink. Your heart will sink. And you will have a righteous anger over what we have been taught and what we have been, the way, how many times we have been lied to. For generations, generations we have been lied to. These are the end times. It's time to wake up and get back to the things of Yahweh God the Father. That's what we're calling for at Holy Impact Ministries, is a new Reformation era. And that's what we are going to do. 
uh, to the best of our ability. We will scream it through the rooftops. We love Yahweh God the Father. We keep the things of God not to be saved, not to earn anything, but because we love him, because we have the Holy Spirit, because we know this pleases our Father who gave his only begotten Son that we may have the hope of eternal life. With that being said, I'd like to say God bless you if you've been here through all of that. I know you have a thirst for truth. And that's the way Yahweh God the Father wants to be worshipped, in spirit and in truth. God bless you. Thank you so much, uh, my friends, for staying with me. And thank you for supporting us at HolyImpactMinistries.com. You have no idea how much you mean to us. In the meantime, my hope and my prayer is that the grace and the peace of God would be with you and your family, and the hand of God in his protection would be upon you until we meet again. God bless you, and shalom.